Uh, thank you for coming to today's event on regulating risky research, the science and governance of pathogens of pandemic potential. I'm Tony Mills, uh, senior fellow and director of our new Center for Technology, Science, and Energy here at AEI. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Thank you also to those of you who are tuning in online. Um, I thought I would start by just saying a few words about why we're here and what we're hoping to accomplish, and then diving as quickly uh, as we can into the substance of today's event. Um, as you all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought renewed public attention and interest to a small subset of life sciences research on so-called pathogens of pandemic potential. In particular, scientists, policymakers here in Washington and beyond, as well as the broader public, have been discussing and debating the benefits and risks of research that involves enhancing the transmissibility or virulence of certain pathogens in humans. A scientific approach popularly referred to with a catch-all and sometimes misleading term, gain-of-function research. Unfortunately, uh, as in many other domains of life, though the politics of COVID-19 has shed light on this issue, it has sometimes tended to provide more heat than light, and public debate over gain-of-function research, already contentious within the expert community, has too often been mired in partisanship and sensationalism. Yet meanwhile, despite and sometimes even because of these political dynamics, a substantive policy debate is going on here in Washington and elsewhere. A number of stakeholder organizations, both inside and outside government, are currently considering prospects and proposals for reforming existing protocols, regulations, and policy, policies for this type of research. A debate that brings to, together a host of complex and important issues, ranging from national security and public health, to scientific freedom and technological innovation, to bioethics and government oversight. So the goal of today's event is to convene a group of experts and stakeholders to grapple with these questions uh, with a view to informing and hopefully also modeling an evidence-based and civil approach to a debate on a complex technical issue with important ramifications for the public interest. I want to make one caveat about the scope of our topic, which is that while the COVID-19 pandemic has thrust the issue of gain-of-function research into the public consciousness, the focus of today's event is not about COVID, particularly the debate over COVID origins, the question of whether COVID-19 originated with a lab leak accident or had natural origins. This is obviously a very important debate, and it's related to the topic of, of today, but our focus here is on the governance of pathogen research. The nature of this kind of research, why we do it, the risks and the benefits, the current policies, and prospects for reform. <clears throat> this is a debate, as many of the people in the room here and watching online will know, that long predates the COVID-19 pandemic, and it will be of relevance going forward, regardless of how the debate over COVID origins uh, gets resolved. Okay, so uh, we have two panels today. Uh, we have a terrific lineup of experts and stakeholders. Uh, the first, which I'll introduce presently, is going to consider the science of pathogen research, what kind of research we're talking about in this uh, policy debate today, why and how we perform it, what kinds of techniques are involved, what are the benefits, the risks, what are the alternatives to this kind of research. And this discussion will tee up the topic of the second panel, which will consider the current regulatory and policy landscape, how we got where we are today and where we ought to go. Uh, each panel will run for an hour with a short coffee break in between. Uh, each session will also allow time for audience Q&A. For those who are watching online, um, you're able to ask questions as well. So please submit questions by email. Uh, to, you should see this on your screen, but to Price St. Clair, that's price.stclair at aei.org, or using the Twitter X hashtag AEA, uh, AEIGOF. Um, for those in person, please feel free to stick around after our second panel. We'll have a wine and uh, hors d'oeuvre reception in the hallway here outside the auditorium. Okay, so with that, um, I'd like to introduce our first panel. Um, joining us here in person, we have Mark Lipsich, Professor of Epidemiology and Director of the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. During the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Mark was named the founding co-director of the Center for Forecasting and Outbreak Analytics, 
with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where he now serves as a senior advisor. Joining us remotely uh, is Gustavo Palacios, a virologist and professor of microbiology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. He was previously head of the Directorate of Foundational Sciences for the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, where he led the application and development of molecular epidemiology to advance the field of biopreparedness. Thank you both for, for joining us. I've asked each Mark and Gustavo to prepare some brief remarks uh, to launch our conversation today. And so without further ado, I will hand it over to Mark to launch us off. Feel free to come to the podium or stay seated as you prefer. Thanks. Do we have Gustavo? He's here. Okay, good. Uh, thank you, Tony, and thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I should start by saying that I'm not speaking in any relation to my government advisory role, but in my private capacity as an academic. Um, I want to start by framing the discussion around what is the what is the class of research uh, and um, of scientific endeavor that is at issue or should be at issue in these discussions. Um, and I think it's, as, it's important to frame it narrowly in the sense that uh, all of us, virtually everyone in this discussion on whatever side or sides uh, sees the value of science as our best hope for improving um, health uh, and, and wants to promote its success and its speed uh, in almost uh, in, in every way possible and also its safety. So uh, the category of research that, is, uh, that should be under debate uh, is not the large majority of scientific research that carries essentially no risk to anyone, nor even the category of biological research, such as work on pathogens that could cause illness in the people working on them, uh, which poses risks mainly at that individual level what you could call occupational health risks. Those are not the, those are not the categories that, that are of concern. The categories of concern are those which, through, which could be, uh, which in the event of an accident or, or inadvertent release could lead to a large scale transmission event, such as a pandemic or, or a large outbreak, um, uh, because of the transmissibility of the pathogen being worked on uh, and because of the uh, susceptibility of the, pop of the human population. Um, it also includes an overlapping but not identical category of research that poses a biosecurity risk, whereby the information gained from the, from the work could lead uh, in the hands of someone with malicious intent to facilitating that person's work uh, to cause uh, a large-scale outbreak. So biosafety on a, on a large scale and biosecurity are the, are the issues at hand. Um, a group that several of us in the room, uh, including me, were involved in uh, called the Pathogens Project, uh, launched by the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists about a year and a half ago, is coming out with a report uh, next week um, that I th hope people will have a look at. Uh, it comes out a week from today. Um, and in that report, we spent a lot of time trying to think about what is what does that, that category of pandemic risky research uh, include? And we essentially made a list of three types of research, of three types of science. One is on, on, pand on agents, uh, microbes, uh, which currently in their unaltered form have the, oper have the ability to cause a pandemic. For example, smallpox virus right now in a relatively unvaccinated world, uh, if released, could uh, could cause a large-scale outbreak or pandemic. The second category is, is work to enhance agents which currently don't have that potential, but where the results of the research, the results of the alterations that are being done in the laboratory, uh, have the possibility of creating something uh, that could cause a pandemic. Um, and the, the um, controversial work about a little more than a decade ago on enhancing avian H5N1 flu, uh, which was highly virulent but not highly transmissible in mammals, to become transmissible in mammals, uh, potentially including humans, is by most people's judgment in that second category. 
And the third category would be uh, research on, uh, or even um, work with agents where the, path, the pandemic potential is unknown but suspected to be possible. So that's the categories. Um, as as um, Tony said earlier, the term gain of function is a way too broad term for this uh, and also too narrow. So smallpox virus un, unchanged would be of concern. Experiments to alter the function and add functions to microbes in general are not problematic because they do not create a pandemic risk. Um, so it's both broad, too broad and too narrow. We should get rid of the term, but we probably can't. Uh, the term gain of function research of concern is a decent approximation, although it is also still too narrow. Um, and we really are in a terminological uh, morass. But, um, but I think if we think of it in terms of what is the risk created by the activity that the scientists undertake, uh, that's a useful starting point. So I'll stop there and uh, turn it over to Gus. So my name is uh, Gustavo Palacios. I am a virologist, uh, as was presented. I started my career in doing pathogen discovery. I mean, a lot of the work that we did in my early days was uh, essentially virus hunting. So I mean, this um, this debate is very close uh, to my uh, to my heart. Uh, and I, I, uh, after 10 years working in, in, in a BSL-4 containment at Fort Detrick, obviously biosafety and biosecurity are, are very close uh, also to all the work that is being done here, there. Um, I agree with Mark, uh, and I was prepared to talk about this similar, similar frame framework, that is that the first thing that it needs to happen is an understanding and a definition of, of this scope of the of the debate uh, and and essentially what are the the nuances that affect each of those three categories? I mean, what it is a an, a non circulating virus or an extinct virus that we should be uh, should care about and smallpox. Obviously, it's a, it's one of those agents that there is a tons of regulations in the type of work uh, that can be done, and there is uh, extreme agreement uh, among most of the virologists of what is the type or how to perform if any uh, uh, studies are needed uh, with those agents. Um, there there are there are among those uh, you know. Obviously, the the caveats of identifying exactly what is the susceptibility of the population to those agents and differentiate very, uh, very clearly between viruses where there is no protection at all and other viruses where there is uh, some herd immunity due to uh, to natural uh, natural circulation of similar viruses. Um, the second category is is uh, most uh, uh, related with the list of pathogens that have uh, uh, been uh, considered uh, for uh, as potential pandemic pathogens. And therefore, experiments where we are uh, modifying their virulence or the transmissibility obviously uh, could be or should be very highly regulated. Um, those, um, the the, I, I think that the the main uh, concern there is to define that list and and ensure that we go from uh, you know the 15 uh, entities or seven viruses that are mentioned in the in this uh, in the select agents of the list of uh, agents of research of concern um, to the uh, NSABB uh, new um, take. Uh, where essentially all all viruses, all viruses from all categories that could uh, reasonably anticipated to exhibit um, um, potential uh, uncontrollable spread in human populations should be considered. So it's like we where is where are the um, where where is the best way to figure out exactly how that uh, how those restrictions should should look like is that a list is that the a, a, a context 
explanation of what it is pot potential pandemic uh, pathogens. I think that that is an important part of what we need to do in the future. And the third one is the unknowns. And as I said, I mean, I work in virus hunting uh, or pathogen discovery for several years. And therefore, um, I mean, there are, there are uh, rules that were unspoken before uh, I guess, and that now needs to be cod uh, codified, right? I mean, if you are if you are working with a with a virus that is from a family or or group of viruses that is known to have a a pathogen a pathogen of concern, you should be sure to ensure that you are using the correct biosafety and biosecurity measures to do that work. And, and, and essentially, if we start by agreeing in what are the boundaries for each of those three categories, I think that the rest of the debate will, uh, will be more, more clear. I, I do not think that there are so much, so many disagreements. Uh, you know, yes, there are a lot of vocal voices, very vociferous. Uh, voices that um, that um, that polarize the debate, but when when people start talking about the real real examples, I think that there is a lot more um, consensus, and I will stop there. Thank you both. So uh, one question I, I'd like to start, and maybe this will be for for uh, Gus, um, uh, but Mark, I'm curious for you to answer as well is a sort of naive question, right? So as Mark indicated, obviously different kinds of research pose different kinds of risks. Um, you know, certain life sciences research poses risk to the researchers themselves, um, the potential to be exposed to a dangerous pathogen. Um, clinical research can pose risks to the subjects of research. Um, but arguably, when it comes to the kinds of research we're talking about here, there's a, a different kind or a different degree of risk uh, insofar as we're talking about a population level kind of risk, an outbreak or something like this. And I, I think the first question that the non-expert onlooker to this debate wants to ask, and I think it's an important question to ask, is why are we doing this kind of research in the first place? Um, particularly research that enhances the functionality of pathogens that are, are dangerous or could become dangerous. What is the scientific, public health, med medical benefit justification for this research, rather than just saying, obviously we shouldn't be making dangerous pathogens more dangerous. Uh, so maybe starting with, with you, Gustavo. Well, I mean, in, in, in the framework that we just uh, outlined it with, with Mark, essentially you are referring to the second category, right? And those are, we're talking about pathogens that we know that they are that they have a level of pathogenicity or virulence and what the type of experiments that you're referring are the experiments with those pathogens where we will enhance that transmissibility or virulence. So I contest that there are very, very, very few uh, experiments of that uh, type that under current regulations could be approved. Uh, there are certain type of, uh, of, of, of pieces of research that actually would be, a, 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 they need to be done um, in, in terms of, of, of biopreparedness. So, for example, if you, are, um, if you are developing a monoclonal antibody uh, for treatment of a particular um, um, disease, uh, and that, that antibody, you have 20 different candidates on, in a pharma industry, and you want to understand what of those are more um, efficient or, or less uh, prone to, uh, to failure. I mean, you want actually to understand exactly how that, uh, that antibody uh, could, be, um, could be, um, res become resistant to that, to that, to that countermeasure. So therefore, you want to do the experiments that are needed to understand what are the type of, 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 uh, of epitopes that are more useful than others. And if you want to, do, to, to, to have that knowledge and to be able to have the best 
um, a countermeasure, probably you want to triage them and figure out which of the ones are less prone to, to, to mutations and, and evasion. So therefore, in that case, to have a better biopreparedness, you actually want to know, I mean, how, how they would become resistant. Do you need to do that uh, for with live viruses? No, you might want to do it with surrogate uh, materials. You might want to do it with different systems to try to lower the risk. But the research is important. You know, it's like I, I can kind of, you can use the, the example in COVID-19, we have invested a lot of, uh, of resources in developing monoclonal antibodies that then very quickly become uh, obsolete with the natural evolution of the virus. If we could be able to look at that in principle, we will be making better investments in areas of uh, or, 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 or targets that are less prone to become obsolete. I agree, and I would maybe just highlight some of the some of the points that Gus made and sort of generalize them a bit. So one is that implicitly, I think perhaps the example that many of us will have in mind, I don't know if Gus did or not, but would be would be SARS-CoV-2 as a as a virus for which monoclonal antibodies are important. Escape is common, and understanding escape is is therefore also important. Um, so. That's a category, that, that is an example of something that is a current threat um, and that is already uh, infecting large numbers of people. Um, and where the, the escape from a, an antibody that is not yet even commercially available is not a, in itself a terrible thing. Uh, we'd rather not have it happen. But if that virus got out, it would not be in itself much more dangerous probably, than the ones that we are already dealing with. So the, it's a combination of real biological and public health benefit to that experiment and relatively low risk. So I think that's a, that's, and, so that's a category where I think a reasonable policy would be comfortable letting that go forward with appropriate biosafety. The other important point that Gus made which I think is general, is that often, not always, but often, it's possible to do the experiment in such a way that it doesn't actually create a, a, any pathogen at all or a more, or more dangerous pathogen through the use of surrogate systems. So instead of using the live virus, use a, a pseudovirus or a virus that is another virus expressing one protein of the virus we're interested in. Um, that can be done much more safely uh, and is a way of studying the interactions of the protein uh, uh, and it, an antibody without actually creating something concerning. So my basic view is that we could, uh, <laughs> uh, that we could, uh, could narrow down the, the number of contentious uh, d experiments to a very, very small number if we take those two principles of uh, insisting on high, high benefit and low risk, uh, and also particularly the idea that whenever possible we do the experiment in some way that is safe, even if it would be 10% more informative to do it in a way that is uh, dangerous. So I'd like to come back to this question of, of the limiting um, this kind of research and also to Gus's point that um, the number of uh, types of research we're talking about here is actually relatively small already. Um, but maybe stepping back a bit, um, you know, Mark, in your in your opening remarks, you mentioned biosecurity and biosafety as two distinct but related frameworks for thinking about this kind of research. And thus far, we've been talking mainly about safety. Uh, historically, security has often been a very important part of this conversation going back before COVID-19. I'm wondering if you could say a bit more about those two frameworks for thinking about research and how we've sort of, and if this is right, we've moved from thinking more about safety now um, in addition to security um, and, and why that is. Um, yeah, I think I, I came into the debate in the middle of it. So I don't, I don't know all of the origins of the security issue, but, but to step back for a minute, 
Um, it might be hard initially to think of what is a, a potential biosecurity risk, but not that has no safety concerns. Um, and so a good example of that was an experiment that was done in 2001 in Australia, where researchers took a mousepox virus, so a, a related virus to variola virus uh, it causes smallpox in humans, um, but, but a virus that, causes, that poses no risk to humans. They've, they inserted a, a gene for a cytokine or an immune modulatory molecule uh, into that virus and were able to show in mice, which are the host of that virus, that, uh, that inserting that extra gene into the virus made it capable of infecting even vaccinated mice. So unless you're a mouse, this is not a mortal threat to you um, uh, immediately. But the reason people were concerned about that experiment, and many people thought it should not have been done, was that it potentially poses, uh, suggests a recipe for someone to do the same thing in a human pathogen. Um, so that's an example of where biosecurity and biosafety are, are not the same concern. There's also essentially anything that you create that's new and, and which accidentally released could cause a pandemic is also something, roughly speaking, which if deliberately released could cause uh, a large outbreak. And so there is a lot of overlap, but it's not precise overlap. Um, I think different people see different parts of this as especially salient. I got interested in the, in the safety side because of my background and because it seemed to me that that alone is probably easier to quantify because it doesn't require no knowledge of human psychology, which I certainly don't have very good <laughs> version of. Um, it doesn't, and it doesn't require a lot of knowledge of sort of covert threats. Um, and to me, that was a, a sort of more solid ground on which to, to discuss this. Um, it may or may not be, safety may or may not be as big or a bigger problem than security. I think different people have different intuitions um, uh, about that. Um, so I think that the security issue um, can't be forgotten, and even though I tend not to focus on it, I think people should. Um, and in particular, as the discussion about um, protein design, artificial intelligence, and the ability to create in a computationally a new and dangerous thing, uh, that, that is another, that's like doing it in a mouse. It's a, it's a recipe, it's not in itself dangerous until it's, it, until it's acted on, but the, but the knowledge is itself. So I think the AI connection to biology that many people are beginning to think about is really much more of a biosecurity issue, although it's also a biosafety issue if people decide to, to actually make the things that they're designing. So I wanna come back to that AI uh, point uh, in a bit, but sort of circling back to the earlier point that, that Gus made. You know, so we, we have existing frameworks for governance, for regulation, whether for security or safety, uh, you know, a number of different ones, and um, a lot of the current policy discussions about how to think about the relationship or to reform them, combine them. I guess the question I want to ask um, both of you, maybe starting uh, with Mark, because it's sort of inspired by something that, that Gus said earlier, is, you know, is that, are those current frameworks enough? I mean, how, how much research is going on now that poses a kind of risk that's not captured by these current uh, uh, regulatory uh, regimes? We'll hopefully hear a lot more about this in our second panel, but I think it's an important question to think about just to delimit the scope of what it is we're talking about here. Yeah, it's a big question because of course it varies, most, for most pathogens it varies from country to country and jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, we have an incredibly tight regulatory regime for one pathogen, which Gus mentioned, which is smallpox virus. That is very, very hard to do experiments with. It's extremely tightly regulated and only a very limited, I believe, two laboratories are allowed to, to even work with it. Um, that is not, that is good enough for, for safety for all these other concerns that we're talking about, but it would be over-regulation because it, it makes it almost impossible to do significant science on. Um, uh, the, the global landscape will, would take a long time to discuss, but, but uh, there are lots of countries that have essentially very little regulation. There are, are 
uh, there are countries that have regulation that is of variable levels of enforcement. Um, and in the United States, there, are, there is a set of principles called the P3CO framework that is being, uh, that uh, we'll hear more in the second panel uh, about some suggested reforms to um, that are being considered now and, and maybe we'll hear more about where that might go. Um, some of us who are concerned about that current framework have, have raised specifically concerns that uh, it is too narrow in what it covers because it doesn't cover, uh, it, it in its current form, uh, covers only uh, pathogens that are already highly virulent. And with, with COVID, we've learned that things that are modestly virulent, but virulent in some people uh, or, or moderate levels of virulence are uh, capable of causing whereas uh, private individuals or, or uh, self-funded um, universities or other laboratories can do work that is not covered by that. Uh, by that. Um, and it's very opaque. So what, happened, what is supposed to happen is that the, uh, the studies that meet a certain definition get extra review from, the, from a group at the Department of Health and Human Services that group's constitution is a secret. The contents of their deliberations are a secret. Um, and the, uh, the, in fact, the NIH document uh, has a, a heading called transparency, which states that this is all secret, which I find slightly, <laughs> slightly um, ironic. Uh, and so that's not the, the entire list of, of concerns, but those are probably the top three areas that I think um, are in the US, which is among the most advanced uh, in its regulation of these things that are still inadequate in the US. So, Gus, maybe um, putting a slightly different slant on that same question, it sounded to me from one of your earlier comments that um, your sense is that a lot of the current um, regulatory policies that are in place actually do um, reasonably well capture some of the kinds of research we're talking about, particularly, for lack of a better term, gain-of-function research, but that there may be other kinds which are not. So I'm curious to hear you speak to this, this problem as well. So, I mean, my, my take, especially after the, the new NSABB uh, report uh, on, on, on the expansion of, of the, the, the scope uh, that it comes with that uh, with that uh, new framework is that most of the uh, the, the things that we have been um, discussing um, will be covered by that new framework. I mean, you know, there is an expansion where we are uh, making clear that any changes that enhance transmissibility or virulence for any pathogen consider previously as a PPP or non-PPP um, are, are covered by the framework if or whether the resulting pathogen is anticipated to follow the, the characteristics of very likely moderately or highly transmissible in unlikely to, ca to cause uh, uncontrollable spread in human populations. So, I mean, a lot of the uh, you know the 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 scope will cover a lot of the 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 the, the previously characterized pathogens if the changes that are proposed are uh, that are proposed in those in that research will change conditions for transmission transmission of virulence. So I think that that is important because essentially um, reduce. Uh, the the misunderstandings, if you want, or the differences in interpretation of the rule. I mean, it's clear that now any pathogen, uh, you know, could be subjected or should be subjected to this uh, to this framework if the resulting is an increase and uh, an enhanced risk. So I think that that covers a lot. Of uh, of the of the framework that we just discussed, the three categories, you know, the the of 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 the you know the extinct viruses, the currently known viruses, and the only concern, in my view, is uh, how to f 
to do future regulation of the unknown and, and what are the right conditions for uh, for performing um, appropriate and biosafe uh, work uh, with uh, with viruses where we have less. Uh, characterization. So obviously, you, we cannot know if we are doing any change that enhance or or change virulence if we don't know where we are starting from. And um, the second aspect is that I, I again I think that we need to be very very careful in when we set up these new frameworks to use precise language. A lot of the things, a lot of the debate actually is because we cannot agree in what gain of function is or gain or, or, or what uh, uh, potential pandemic pathogens are or or defi defining exactly what it is uh, likely or what it is highly likely so if 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 biologists biosafety experts uh, uh, microbiologists in general could not agree in a common sense understanding of what what the language means, then we need to go back to make rules that are even more clear and define it uh, to define the scope of how the work needs to be performed. Sticking with this issue for a minute, I, w one of the challenges is that the nature of research is is unpredictable, and so a lot of the advocates of the kind of research we're talking about will point out that it's hard to weigh the risks and the benefits when we don't necessarily know what all the benefits are. We also, of course, don't always know what all of the risks are either. And I guess the, the, the question is, what, what policy tools do we have for thinking about this question when you're doing research on a certain kind of pathogen could wind up becoming risky in a way that's not predictable? Are there, you know, we do have the possibility of putting lists together of certain uh, pathogens which you know require more oversight or should be banned altogether but you know the danger of lists is that they're precise and if we don't know what might be on the list in the future we're sort of missing things but the alternative is that we don't really have a, a good structure for thinking about oversight so how, how do we balance those two is there is there a way to do that at the level of, of policy or is this something that has to be devolved to researchers and in their institutions <laughs> First, I, I, I am all, in most cases, I believe that the research needs to be done. And it needs to be done the right way by ensuring that it is done with the lowest risk possible. And I accept that there is going to be instances where the risk is not, uh, there is no enough return on investments and the research should not be done. So that should be analyzed. One of the advantages of working on a BSL-4 uh, for many years is to understand that, yes, that research should be slow and should have a lot of uh, pay, uh, steps and it should have a lot of regulations. And and yes, I mean it's well. I mean it's uh, it 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 bec there are uh, there are safety and biosecurity procedures that need to be followed uh, that will be for most of the uh, you know basic biology work uh, and um, hard to um, to to compare with research on viruses that are not that do not have those risks but that is how it should be that doesn't mean that the research should not be done I mean there are a lot of reasons why this the information that you are gathering from that type of research is it is necessary and you need to make the case and yes that is going to take t time I think I would say that the knowledge needs to be gained, but which exact experiment needs to be done is is part of the question. Um, and not not all knowledge is worth a, an arbitrary level of risk. So um, uh, I actually think that if you uh, again that the the idea of sort of narrowing down, it's not that there it's not that I think there are essentially no experiments that need regulating. So there are a lot of experiments that need regulating, but which can be replaced, as, as Gus was alluding to, 
with things that, that don't need much regulating or don't, don't need, uh, don't need um, any regulating because they're essentially safe. Um, and so, uh, apart from basic laboratory biosafety that, that protects the individuals, but, but in terms of pandemic risk, uh, if you tell me an experiment that creates a pandemic risk, I think, not I because I'm not a virologist, but, but a, a community of virologists set the task of finding an almost as good answer uh, with an entirely safe experiment could almost always do that. Um, and uh, and we talked about the the use of surrogate systems as one of the major ways in which that happens. Doesn't always work, but it, it helps a lot. Um, similarly, if you are uh, if you're thinking about um, trying to understand which genetic changes are associated with uh, with transmissibility, um, one way to do that is to take a, a non-transmissible strain like the H5N1 that had infected a human from a bird that was the starting point of the famous uh, controversial studies a decade ago and try to make it transmissible. Another thing you can do is to compare transmissible to non-transmissible strains uh, in the wild and look at the genetic differences among them. And if you actually look at the genetic changes that were identified in those uh, risky experiments, Every single one of them had been found in a risk-free way, in a uh, either through studying the proteins individually, through studying uh, comparative uh, sequences of, of transmissible and non-transmissible strains. Um, and, and to be fair, you didn't know that until that experiment had been done. So, uh, so it could have been that they, had, they might have found something else. Uh, but as it happens, every single one of them had been found uh, through a safe type of experimentation. So, uh, you know, I'm open in pr principle to the idea that there is some extremely pandemic risk-taking experiment that needs to be done in the most high containment way possible because it generates a unique class of knowledge that we really can't get any other way. But I think that's a hypothesis. I think we should try as hard as we can to think about the, the ways to do it more safely. And that, that the right comparison, to get to your question about the unknown benefits of science, the right comparison is not do the, the risky experiment versus do no experiment, but rather do a risky experiment versus use the same resources to do a set of experiments that are not risky. And usually those non-risky experiments, because they are not risky, can be done with more different virus strains, with more replication in the laboratory, and therefore much better statistical power. So you get more generalizable, more statistically reliable information on the whole from non-dangerous experiments than from dangerous ones because you just can't do that many uh, uh, in a high biocontainment laboratory. And if you look at some of the, one of the papers in particular that came out of the, um, the H5N1 enhancement experiments, there were comparisons of two mice I mean, sorry, two ferrets against two ferrets with statistical conclusions about, about the difference between transmission. You cannot draw a comparison. Zero out of two is the same as two out of two statistically. Not the same. It's indistinguishable statistically from two out of two. But that was what they could do because they had limited resources because of the need for biocontainment. So you can do a lot more science uh, for the same cost uh, in time and money uh, and and often get more out of it, even if you get if you don't get every single thing the same. Mark, one of the things you've emphasized in some of your writing on this topic is that in some areas of research, we're accustomed to having ethical frameworks, restrictions. For instance, in clinical research, where we're doing research on human subjects, there are lots of uh, restrictions that go with that for obvious reasons. And you've argued for, uh, and there are other areas of bioethics we can think about too. Um, you've argued for essentially extending those frameworks or applying them to this class of research where you have population level risks as, as, as a possibility. I'm wondering if you could say a bit about the bioethical principles that are at stake here, the historical context for thinking about that, and what it would look like to use those frameworks for informing this sorts of sort of research. 
Yeah, it's an analogy that I use with trepidation because most people who do human subjects research have horror stories about uh, about things that were restricted or made difficult uh, with no identifiable benefit. To be completely frank, and I'm I, I include myself um, among those people. Um, so I think the analogy needs to be partial, and I'll get back to that at the end. But the, the fundamental idea that goes all the way back to the beginning of modern bioethics is that to create, if you're going to create a risk to individuals, there has to be a corresponding and larger benefit uh, that, that those individuals or, or people like them are, are capable of, uh, of realizing as a result of the research. Um, so that, that basic insight, uh, I think most, um, virtually anybody who works on human subjects agrees is correct. Um, nobody thinks, nobody with a very small number of exceptions, I think believes that uh, sort of unrestricted research on human subjects is, is appropriate. Um, and I think we, the, the part of the analogy that I want to hang on to is the idea that when the people that, who are at risk are potentially in a different country or unaware of the research at all uh, because the uh, transmissible agent causes harm to, to potentially people around the world, that we should have at least as much concern about those unaware, unconsenting people as we have about, uh, about people who are... Um, who are the subjects of, of human subjects research. Um, I will say, to come back to something I started with, unlike human subjects, unlike the current practice of human subjects research, which I think is actually not great, uh, um, one characteristic, as I would describe current human subjects, is, uh, is the idea that we, we err on the side of, of not doing something. We, we, we try to make it hard to do something that's on the borderline, uh, and we sort of build a, a perimeter around the real harms that we are trying to avoid because we, we think it's better to avoid the harm than to risk committing it. I think part of our job in thinking about the, the, this pathogen research is to draw that line narrowly um, and to not only and, and to try to speed up research that is not risky but is valuable at the same time that we slow down or, or try to stop research that is um, that is too risky. Um, a, a lot of the those who are resistant to um, greater regulation in this area say there's so much gray area. Will will you know everything will just grind to a halt and. There are examples that people cite of, of research that probably isn't risky being delayed uh, by concern or, or, or about um, whether it does fall in this category. So I think drawing the circle narrowly to, to really insist on careful scrutiny of things that c c carry pandemic risk while green lighting and, and speeding up uh, those things that don't and making that distinction quickly accurately but quickly. It's a resource intensive request, but it's, it's just money. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not even that much money compared to the overall research enterprise. That would be a good use of, of a small amount of the research funding is to, uh, is to have this process be efficient so that we are very targeted in what we're concerned about. So I want to make sure we have time for audience questions, but I, I did want to ask uh, one last question at, at the risk of ending on a a uh, very unwieldy uh, topic, but the subject of artificial intelligence came up earlier, and I'm curious, uh, Gus, you know, there's a lot of discussion in, in Washington right now about AI risk um, and discussion about whether and how to regulate uh, AI. I'm curious how you think about AI in the context of the discussion we're having today. Where do you see it living in the categories of risk that you um, outlined at the beginning? Is it something we should think about as significantly changing the game, adding a material kind of uh, change to risk levels? Is it something that could help us solve some of these problems? What, what's the right way? It's just at a you know, very general level to think about this question. 
I could I could say that in in virology and in microbiology in general, I could uh, I think that the impact right now of uh, artificial intelligence and large language models is modest, um, but that is because there is not enough data uh, and data points for those uh, systems to build. Uh, enough knowledge to do any type of uh, reasonable uh, predictions. Uh, uh, therefore, you know, yes, you are always going to get some uh, type of uh, uh, response, but that doesn't mean that it is more informed response to what you can do actually uh, with 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 the current uh, knowledge in biology. So, I mean, that that could change uh, obviously with time, but that is the 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 situation today. Uh, I, I could say that also, you know, it's like if you start thinking about protein design and protein uh, synthetic uh, biology, you have a lot better, uh, you know, applications of artificial intelligence that do not need to uh, to go to the modifications or the predictions of how different viruses are going to behave uh, to call to to to. To, to use that in terms of with, them, with nefarious purposes, right? So I, I do not think that in that realm, I mean, it's also, it, it, it also makes, um, makes a significant harm today um, that again, at the speed that these uh, things are, are changing in, in the computational biology uh, uh, realm, it could change uh, very, very fast. I also want to make sure we have time for audience questions. So um, we have microphones. So uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone. And if you could please uh, uh, introduce yourself, your name and, and affiliation. Keep the question a question and reasonably short, please. So uh, yes, uh, right here. Mark Lerner, um, I, I don't want to argue about the origins of COVID, but I'm just wondering, was gain of function re research being done in a lab in Wuhan, China, on which was funded by NIH, uh, Rand Paul's argument? Do you gentlemen know? Fair enough. I don't know if, Gus, you have any on on that. It's certainly beyond the scope of, of what we're uh, talking about here. So I, I can't speak to it. I, I don't have the pertinent expertise. So maybe uh, next question. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Steph Vitalis from CSET. Uh, question for you. I think uh, both of you made this point and I'm in agreement that, um, you know, within the much broader context of gain-of-function research, there's a really small subset that is really what's at this discussion. Um, and, you know, you've talked about maybe needing better, more precise language to better define which experiments those are and what research that is. Um, I guess my question is still how to how to do that. I think that's still the the big question is what falls into that bucket um, and how to sort of draw that boundary when risk is a spectrum and not necessarily a clearly defined binary uh, factor. I don't know if you want me to to tackle that, Mark. Uh, I, I, you know, I mean, this is there have been a lot of changes in the last twenty years in this field, right? I mean, there are there are, you know, if you go to all of the regulations that came out uh, out of uh, you know since uh, since those uh, flu and coronavirus. Uh, um, experiments. There had been a lot of modifications in the way that things are are are, are being done. I mean, there are uh, there is very clear outlines of how to work with uh, you know again the 15 entities and the seven viruses that are involved in that list of uh, of uh, dual use research of concern. And there are a very clear yes or no questions in that. Uh, 
uh, in that pipeline that did their mind, uh, you know, what, what, what it is and what it is not um, dual use. It, it can be done. It was done. It was done properly. I mean, there, as as far as I know, there had not been a lot of uh, concerns about that list about that framework. I do not see how why that cannot be extended uh, to other pathogens that were not considered uh, initially in that list to guide the conversation. And uh, and 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 I think that the, the framework exists, and it is the result of all of these. Debate. I mean, this there is uh, since uh, I started. Uh, I started uh, working in virology in Argentina, uh, working with uh, FMDV, that is a is a, a select agent uh, for for animal for cattle. And at that time, we were working on a bench uh, with, uh, with without the fume hood and and you know pi mouth pipetting. And from there now is obviously a, a, a pathogen that is managing strictly a very few facilities, and all of that uh, was changes in regulations and and that had been uh, rightly full, rightfully imposed by increases in biosafety and biosecurity. So obviously, I mean the. The, it's, it's not that this field is extant and 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 there is not uh, there is, has not been work. Uh, you know, I mean, there is a path that could be followed. You just need informed and patient people to set and uh, to define how what needs to be changed and uh, avoid the vociferous people that are that actually want to make a political statement. A key point is that the goal is not perfect definition, but harm reduction, right? I mean, if we if we can stop some dangerous things from happening, that's all the best anyone can hope for. Um, and if we can green light work that is safe, that's also equally important or similarly important. Um, uh, but I think, you know, there are some very clear criteria. If you're working with a vector-borne virus in a place where there are no vectors, you're not going to start a pandemic with with that experiment. If you're working uh, on an existing virus without modifying it uh, in a in a context where there's lots of immunity to that virus, you're not likely to start a pandemic. I mean, we could talk about some special edge cases, but essentially that's that's true. Um, uh, and on the other hand, I mean the the very purpose of the 2011, 2012 experiments to enhance the transmissibility in mammals uh, was the stated purpose was to understand what could cause a pandemic. Therefore, either it's meant to identify ferret mutations that make something transmissible in a ferret, uh, which are also relevant to humans, or it's misleading, in which case it's probably not going to help us to do that experiment. So by hypothesis, the purpose was to make a virus that was capable of, of causing a pandemic. Um, and so I think there are some really clear cases and that getting even those right would be a step forward. I'm sure there are some in the middle, um, but, but again, with the principle of whenever possible trying to find the, the safer alternative, um, I just don't think it's a huge category of sort of unregulated or, or, or un, of hugely ambiguous space. We, uh, we have an online question um, from Gerald Epstein, uh, Gerald Epstein, who uh, has no current affiliation but says he was responsible for developing the P3CO policy when I served in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, and the question is for Dr. Uh, Palacio. Um, he said that it was very difficult to apply policies that contain subjective terms such as, quote, highly likely, especially because we are trying to predict the properties of a pathogen that has not yet been created. Clearly, we can't have certainty about that, given that the only reason to do research is because we don't already know the results. Given all that, what is the alternative to asking researchers and reviewers to estimate in an admittedly subjective fashion what they think the likely or possible outcomes of a piece of research might be? We can't wait until the experiment is over to decide whether or not we should have done it. 
Dr. Palacios therefore saying, is Dr. Palacios therefore saying that we can't have any policy that tries to make decisions based on the possible or likely outcomes of a not yet conducted experiment? If so, is the answer that we can't have any such policies at all? I, unfortunately, the, 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 the audio was a breakdown in, in, in several parts of what you, what you read. Um, I do not know if I completely understand the, 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 the question from Mr. Epstein. Uh, I, 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 be, I, I do not think that the policy, um, uh, I, I, no, I, I, I think that there, we should have a clear, uh, a clear policy of how to deal with, uh, with the unknown. And it's not too complicated to set up a rule uh, that essentially says, with some uh, degree of uh, taxonomic definitions, that pathogens that belongs to groups that uh, that contains other pathogens that are known to be uh, at the or to need a certain level of of uh, biosafety or biosecurity need to be handled in the same way until. It, they are demonstrated not to not to present those uh, those type of properties, and I, I think that that is a, it's it, it's it's a it's a rule that actually could be established very very quickly for for doing that on 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 pathogen discovery um, type of uh, scenarios. Yeah, just that I think. Um, I, I've been persuaded back and forth and back and forth about the virtue of lists versus risks, uh, and I don't even know where I stand <laughs> at this point um, uh, as to whether it's feasible to, to use words rather than a list of, of pathogens. I would like to think it is, but, but I understand the arguments that legally it's hard. I do think that the, the question of who does the assessing is an important one and that it should not be solely left to the people who wish to do the experiment. Um, and we have, you know, we have mechanisms for that. It's called peer review of proposals. And um, you have to deal with things that are not in the proposal and changes and all of that. But we, we do have a system whereby scientists criticize each other's reasoning uh, and question the assertions of our fellow scientists. Um, having just been on a study section, there's a lot of that. That's what, what uh, grant reviewers do. Um, and so I think, first, there has to be some agreement that this is a legitimate question to be asking. Uh, and then once there is, then that, you know, a, a peer review type of model would be one way to implement the, the assertions of, you know, I think this is totally safe, uh, or I think this is not totally safe. Hi, uh, Ari Schulman with the New Atlantis. You're anticipating a little bit the question I wanted to ask, but I'd like to ask you to, to elaborate on this a little bit. Uh, not just in terms of the implementation, but the decision of the rules. Who should decide the questions that are being asked on this stage? You seem to have a scientific community that has become increasingly mistrustful of the public to know what they're talking about, and a public that doesn't trust a scientific community to self-regulate. How do, you, how do you deal with that problem in deciding who makes a decision about what the lab safety rules should be? That, that the, the view that scientists should be left to do what they want to do or, or to figure out their own rules for how they do what they want to do, uh, I don't think is tenable when there's when there's a public investment and a public ri or and or a public risk, um, uh, the recent book a couple of years ago by Zeynep Pamuk on this topic I think is informative. I'm blanking on the title of it, but uh, it's Princeton University Press book about the public role in science uh, in science policy. How do you use science in a democracy? That's the subtitle or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's either look it up. <laughs> um, uh, but it's a good book. Uh, it's kind of a radical proposal. But, but, the, but the concept that when public funds or public safety is at, at stake, the public should have a role in 
uh, in thinking about it through, in this case, you know, in our case through representatives is, to me, is a totally legitimate thing. That doesn't mean that, that Congress should be micromanaging every decision uh, about science. It does mean that there's a reason that, that the people and the, and, and the representatives should be able to get answers to their questions about uh, the, the rationale for particular experiments and the, um, and the benefits and the, and the risks that they entail. Um, but ultimately, it, it does require expertise to make those judgments about risks and, and benef benefits. Uh, so it can't be a purely, uh, I mean, it, it requires the scientific community to engage. But I think, again, the, that, that's another piece, again, putting, <laughs> noting that human subjects regulation is far from perfect right now the way we do it. Uh, another good feature of it is that we have a, a, a system that uh, allows expertise but also imposes some rules from the outside. I want to make sure we have time for a short break before our next panel. So maybe just one more short question uh, right here. <clears throat> so, um, uh, David Carrick, and uh, so the appropriate regulation um, and is one thing, and then the incentive and the culture to follow the regulations are another. And I'm wondering, um, are you comfortable with the current uh, standards for justification uh, for foreign institutions when NIH grants are reviewed as a justification for doing work in a foreign institution. Are you comfortable with that? Does it change with this kind of research? And do those regulations or those considerations need changing? So go, Mark. So I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna give you a very satisfying answer. Gus, do you have any thoughts? So I, I, I guess that I'm going to take it. I, I, I do not think that uh, you know for, for the public health type of uh, analysis that we are considering here. I mean the 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 difference if the research would be done. Uh, in the states or, uh, or or in a foreign institution should not should should be the same, right? I mean the 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 benefit or or the risk is uh, would be the should should be analyzed at the same level. Uh, so and I think that that is a lot of what we are doing here. So I, I do not think that uh, that you know the 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 risk analysis would be. Uh, could come with a different conclusion than the, if the the decision of the U.S. government of uh, of funding um, you know activities uh, abroad uh, it's it's uh, it's a it's a different uh, uh, it's a different analysis and there are different considerations that that that, need, that are in place but it's not regarding the the biosafety risk assessment. I would just add that is and can be a leader in this area, but to ultimately such work does get funded by other, by non-government agencies, by non-government actors and by uh, other governments besides the United States. And this is a global issue that, that really needs solutions in each country. And also uh, I think uh, has an important role for the journals to play in trying to bring some level of consistency, but that's probably a longer argument than we have time for. Yep, well, we are out of time. So I'd like to thank both Mark and Gustavo. <laughs> so we'll have a short break and reconvene in just a few minutes for our second panel. Thank you.
<laughs> if I can go ahead and get everybody to take their seats, and uh, my, my colleagues on the panel, they, well, they're here. So I'll give everybody um, a few seconds to take your seats, and we'll go ahead and get started. I think everybody's pretty close to, to getting back in place. So I'm Jerry Parker. I am currently the Scowcroft at the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs within the Bush School of Government and Public Service and the School of Veterinary Medicine at Texas A&M University. I must also add, like Mark, that the views I may express today are my own and do not represent any current or past employers or institutional affiliations. First, I want to express my thanks to the American Enterprise Institute for hosting this timely, important discussion today and to the first panel for setting the stage with their discussion on science, security, and risk. It's a perfect segue into panel two's discussion of regulation, oversight, and politics. I'm honored to be here today to moderate discussion with colleagues who have been on the forefront of policy evolution over the years regarding oversight of risky research, dual use research concern, DERC, and enhanced potential pathogen research, EPP research. Time only allows me to provide a brief introduction of our panelists, so please review their bios on the American Enterprise Institute website associated with this event. Our three panelists in alphabetical order are Dr. Greg McElvey. Greg is a senior researcher in Rand, at RAND Corporation and a former assistant director for biosecurity at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Greg has many other career experiences related to the convergence of advancing technologies in biosecurity. Alan Slobodin. Alan is, a, is the major chief investigative counsel, House of Representatives Committee on Energy and Commerce, and he brings a breadth of experience with oversight policies, in, in, including public health, the FDA, and NIH. Alan is a very thoughtful and knowledgeable person about oversight issues. I have observed him over the years to do so in a nonpartisan, professional manner to include when I was subjected to the committee's oversight and his role on the House ENC committee at that time, and on behalf of the public and elected officials. And finally, Dr. Kerry Woolenitz. Kerry is chair of the Health and Bioscience Innovation Policy Practice Group, Lewis Burke Associates. Dr. Woolenitz is an internationally recognized science and health policy expert and former senior government official and dedicated public servant who brings decades of experience, including in-depth experience and knowledge of the evolving biosafety policy landscape. And for myself, your moderator, I have considerable operational experience in biodefense, pandemic preparedness, and health security as an Army officer, senior government official, and now academic, to include ensuring compliance with biosafety and biosecurity policies and regulations of the organizations and programs I led. I am a former commander of USAMRID, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at HHS, and Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Chemical and Biological Defense at DOD. Today, as we heard in the first panel, our dis discussion is focused on dual use enhanced potential pandemic pathogen research, or EPP research. I may slip into acronyms, so my apologies in advance if I do. Dual use enhanced potential pandemic pathogen research, or EPP, in, is an exceedingly small subset of life science research, but potentially dangerous category requiring additional oversight. It is important to note that there is a comprehensive and overlapping bio-risk management framework in the United States that has been, been evolving for over 50 years since the mid-1970s. I don't know if our bio-risk management framework is the best in the world, but it is one of the top, and it is comprehensive. As I thought about the discussion for today, I recalled how we got here specifically regarding dual use EPP research. For me, this debate and my involvement in the debate began with the Australian mousepox study that Mark mentioned that was published in 2001. So I came into this debate more on the security portion of the curve, but that later shifted to biosafety. Both were important. The mousepox study was followed by the 2004 National Research Council's Biotechnology and Age of Terrorism Study, commonly referred to as the Fink Report, creation of the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, or NSABB, 2012 and 2014 dual-use research concern guidance policies, 
the 2014-27 moratorium, the 2017 potential pandemic care and oversight guidance or the P3CO framework, and most recent, most recently, the OSCP RFI on the 2023 NSAB recommendations. The questions in this debate have largely centered on ethical considerations, benefit, risk, and public transparency. Do benefits exceed risk? Can risk be mitigated? What are the standards to gauge risk and benefits? What about the growing proportion of non-federally funded research that is not covered by some biosafety policies, including EPP research? How do we link top-down federal guidance and oversight with bottom-up institutional responsibility and accountability? What about public transparency and the growing interest on behalf of the public to be better informed by government and research institutions? I can share, I'd like to share one of my own personal experiences of over 20 years ago when I served as commander of USAMBRID, and that did not include EPP research. We didn't even know that term at the time, but something we might call EPP research of that era because we did not support that type of research at USAMRID. But nonetheless, we conducted research with hazardous pathogens in high containment labs. I thought I worked very hard during that era to provide public transparency to my own community where I lived in Frederick, Maryland, about the importance of our research mission and our biosafety practices. And I think I did at the time. But in retrospect, I wished I would have known then what I know now. I could have done more, and I should have done more to be informed of the public in our community. Public transparency is an essential component of maintaining trust and confidence in our high containment laboratory research enterprise, whether it involves EPP research or not. The issues surrounding EPP research are not new, but the issues are no longer confined to a relatively small set of community of infectious disease scientists, biosafety and biosecurity professionals, and interagency policy meetings, as evidenced by this policy discussion today. The public has more interest in the discussion and interest in transparency into the policymaking process and oversight of these issues. Finally, I think it's important for all of us involved in these discussions to avoid conflating this very small subset of potentially dangerous dual-use EEPP research with the vast majority of life science research that may involve some form of gain-of-function manipulations but are safe when done in compliance with current guidelines. It is also important to note once again that the policies under intense debate now are the dual use EPP policies. But even those oversight policies are a component of a broader bio risk management framework. But all policies evolve. And at some point, it may be, become necessary to review, modernize, harmonize the entire bio risk management framework domestically and internationally, especially to ensure a vibrant bioeconomy while also maintaining reliable reliable biosafety and biosecurity standards worldwide as the pace of technology advancements continue to accelerate. Before I go to our panelists, I want to uh, ask everyone to consider formulating questions as you, as you listen to some of the open remarks and some of the initial Q&A that we will, we will have uh, so you'll be ready to ask questions toward the uh, in this panel. So given that brief perspective and background, I will turn to Dr. Wollenitz first. So Carrie, oversight of pathogen research isn't a new topic, topic, and you've played an essential role from outside and inside government in shaping the policy landscape. Can you give us a brief overview of that history and how it informs us today about the policy questions we are facing? Sure, thank you, Jerry, and uh, uh, thanks also to our host for having this important conversation. I'm gonna try to give you 50 years of policy history in about three minutes. It'll be like the three minute Hamlet, less stabbing, more bureaucracy. Um, uh, you know, we're really dating back to the 70s, which is when our first really broad public discussion of engineered viruses began at the dawn of recombinant DNA. Um, which was sort of the dawn of the biotechnology era. Um, and this, this question of how do we balance the potential benefits of this new technology with the potential risk to human health, because a lot of the fear at the time was the potential um, creation of carcinogenic viruses that could escape 
um, led to a whole lot of public debates, a, a much mythologized meeting of scientists and, and policy wonks in Asilomar, California. Um, and ultimately, the guidelines for recombinant DNA, um, which are owned by the NIH and are still in effect today, that was really the first kind of biosafety manual um, and, and really the first sort of serious um, uh, policy we had on, on biosafety. And so I'm going to fast forward quickly to an era we've heard referred to in 2001. Um, so in 2001 is where we really had this big shift from discussions of biosafety to biosecurity. Um, lots of things happened in 2001, but among them uh, was the Amerithrax incident uh, in which there was um, the sending of anthrax to a number of journalists and Senate offices, which um, caused a uh, very quick reaction in a number of quarters within the US government, but also in the Congress um, in terms of passing the first laws that were really dedicated to controlling dangerous agents beyond just smallpox. So the USA Patriot Act, um, a couple of bills that created what we now call the select agent regulations, which are um, uh, a series of requirements for both facilities and scientists in order to work with a list of pathogens that have been deemed risky. And I'll pause for a moment and um, I, I make a point, which is we've been using terms like policy and regulation very generically throughout the day. Um, in the real world, those are very different things. There's sort of a hierarchy under which we control things as a government. There are laws which are passed from Congress. There are regulations that are derived from those laws through a very formal um, and bureaucratic process by the federal agencies. And then there are the tools of policy and guidance which could be attached to, for example, federal funding of research or the ability to receive federal funds or any sort of benefit from the government and guidelines which are really more of like a professional practice. Now in the real world, the research world in which we exist, a lot of time the stakeholders, whether those are universities, research institutes, and scientists, treat all of these things as if they were carved on tablets from Mount Sinai, um, as if they all have the power of statutes and, and regulation, which is one of the reasons we use the term regulation loosely. But it really does matter as we think about this oversight schema, because there are pros and cons to all of these uh, approaches, which we can talk more about in the discussion. Um, uh, uh, following the select agent uh, regulations, uh, we also had in 2001 um, uh, something that's been referred to several times, which is the arriving on the scene of the concept of dual use research of concern. There were a couple of papers, the Australian mousepox paper we've heard about. There was also a paper related to the synthesis of polio virus from sort of um, off the shelf ingredients. This is kind of the dawn of synthetic biology in a, in a big way that um, I, uh, created this massive uproar over this idea of dual use research, research which is intended for positive benefit, um, but has either inadvertent um, or uh, unpredictable potential negative consequences. And the important thing I think to remember in context here is a lot of our focus at the time was not on the conduct of the research. It was about the information, is about whether or not we should be publishing the methodology of this research or whether in fact, we were publishing a blueprint for terrorists, I think was uh, often the, the term that was used. And so a lot of the debate and discussion at the time, which took place at the National Academies, involved publishers, involved a lot of scientists um, and security experts. And, and it's also important to understand that up to that point, the world of kind of the biomedical community and the security community with you know, limited exceptions like USAMRID didn't really interact very much. This was like a whole new conversation and a huge instant culture clash um, in a lot of these discussions. But it did lead to this um, activity by the National Academies, which um, uh, created the Fink Report, which has been uh, uh, referred to. There was a lot of intergovernmental discussions going on at the time. I know a lot of people in the room were involved in those um, uh, as well about, you know, what would a policy framework work to control dual use research look like. And, and one of the recommendations of the Fink report was um, uh, to create some sort of oversight system uh, uh, to um, uh, 
do a better job of controlling this dual use research of concern. And the Fink report began um, uh, a really clear thread that exists up until now, you heard it in the first panel, of how hard it is to really define what it is we are trying to control here. Um, there was a lot of debate, and what's interesting to me is if you go back and read the Fink report, again, some of you probably haven't looked at it in a really long time, um, the framework of the definition actually hasn't changed that substantially through the years, and I think it's worth pausing and thinking about that. 25 years of, of endless policy debates, discussions, really, really smart people in rooms just like this one or way smaller ones or way bigger ones all over the world, and we haven't actually been able to come up with much of a different definition, and we're still unsatisfied with it, which shows you how hard it is to really define what we're talking about here. Um, but the uh, Fink report also recommended the standing up of a committee, which ultimately became the National Security Advisory Board for Biosecurity, the NSAB. You've, you've heard about that. It is a, um, a FACA committee, so it involves outside experts as well as uh, members from government. And it's really been the nexus of a lot of the um, debates and discussions and public discussions, because it is a FACA committee, their work is done in public, um, around the biosecurity landscape and also a little bit in the biosafety landscape. And it is really ultimately the NSAB's framework and recommendations, which through a number of, of iterations and many, 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 many interagency policy discussions that resulted in what we now call the dual use research of concern policy um, of the US government. This is a, a policy uh, which has sort of two layers, uh, the first being a um, agency level review and the second being an institutional level review that is designed, again, to maximize the benefits um, but also minimize the risk by putting requirements um, on uh, agencies and institutions to ensure that they're uh, uh, attention paid to risk mitigation and communication um, to manage information risks of this research. Uh, the government compromised on this crazy debate of like not being able to define dual use research of concern. It was kind of like that old saw about pornography, like you can't define it, but you know it when you see it. That was the flavor of a lot of these uh, definition debates. Um, uh, by creating a matrix of 15 agents, all of which were on the select agent uh, uh, list and seven experiments of concern, which by the way, were nearly identical to the seven experiments of concern that arose from the Fink report, number one of which was enhancing the, uh, um, uh, the transmissibility or uh, uh, virulence of an agent. So this subset that we now um, uh, unfortunately refer to uh, as gain of function research. Um, uh, as those uh, uh, policies were being developed, we, ha we began the debate, um, uh, which brings us here today, about this subset because of these two flu papers, which you have heard again alluded to, um, in which suddenly we began discussing whether or not it was appropriate to do experiments um, or, or whether we needed additional oversight or even prohibitions against experiments in which we were enhancing to the point of pandemic potential um, existing pathogens, in this case, influenza. The reason this really hit the public's radar screen in a big way um, is because the NSABB, in an unprecedented move at the time, suggested that these papers shouldn't be published um, because they were perhaps too... Um, uh, too dangerous. And this caused a huge uproar and is another good example of how hard the policy landscape is here um, because it's very interconnected across the security and safety policy landscape. For example, if suddenly you decide that research can't be funded, it runs into the, the government definition of fundamental research. Why does that matter? Because the fundamental research definition, which basically says it will be freely published, it's unclassified research, um, triggers things like export control laws. So suddenly, the information contained in the paper is subject to export control laws, and there's this sort of cascading series of events. So it's really easy, again, to talk about it in an abstract and really hard to implement it in terms of 
of policy. Um, the, this flu, uh, these sets of flu papers triggered a pause on um, research with a number of pathogens at the National Institutes of Health, MERS, SARS, and um, uh, 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 types of influenza, um, and thus began a three-year deliberative process to figure out how to oversee um, what we now refer to as gain-of-function research of concern, or PE. E3P or P3CO, all of these are terrible names, and I blame Jerry Epstein, who we heard from um, earlier, for all of them. But to, to give you an idea of what that was like, I'm just going to, I brought a prop here. Um, uh, so uh, uh, the author of this is, is in the back. Thank you, thank you, Rocco. But there were many hands that touched us. This was just one piece of input, so this uh, risk and benefit analysis that went into this three year process, which involved large symposia at the National Academy, many meetings of the NSAB, other um, published papers. So a lot of time and thought went into the P3CO policy, which ended up being essentially an additional level of review at the level of HHS involving experts in security and in intelligence and, um, uh, and science. And, and this brings me to my final point uh, here, which is, um, again, very practically speaking, there's been a lot of um, discussion of transparency and you know when it is that uh, uh, we should make things transparent. I'm a big fan of, of transparency, actually. Um, uh, and um, I think we should be as transparent as possible whenever possible. Um, uh, the thing to understand about the P3CO policy is it was felt very important after all of these stakeholder discussions, three years of massive information, that the review and the discussion about whether or not to conduct the research was done before the research was funded, right? We didn't even want to dip our toes in the water if we really felt, after all of this review and additional oversight, that we shouldn't conduct this research at all, that the, the risk did in no way outweighed or was balanced by the benefits. And because of that, um, uh, these discussions were taking place before the research was funded by a federal agency. Practically speaking, pre-funding um, uh, research decisions are always non-transparent for a lot of reasons, which I think we could, we could talk about, but mostly related to intellectual property protections um, for the researchers involved. And so, um, again, a practical consideration that as we thought about this policy and at what point along the research continuum it made sense to insert that oversight, we inserted it at the place that was sort of inherently non-transparent. And so, um, uh, you know, it's really the practical where the rubber hits the road that is sometimes the hardest part of taking um, these very abstract and interesting conversations and coming down to writing something on paper that all stakeholders could look at and reasonably interpret the same way. Let me stop there. Wow, that's a tour <laughs> to force down memory lane and, and a very comprehensive view over the last 50 years of biosafety, biosecurity um, oversight. And I think it really does highlight you know, one of the huge challenges of implementation of policies, no matter what what they are, you know, implementation where the rubber meets the road can get really hard. I also had just something that triggered um, this tour de force down memory lane is the Amerithrax investigation, and that certainly hit hit me. It was a very intense part of my life, and something I probably haven't experienced, and nobody else in this room has, because I was part of that the Amerithrax Amerithrax investigation and. Those spores also came out of my lab. So I have a unique perspective in that regard and some of these issues. So anyway, um, Dr. Greg McAvee. So Greg, you similarly played a unique role, a role in this kind of nexus between inside government and in the private sector. So from your perspectives, what are the new issues that we must be considered by the scientific community, biosecurity community, the administration and Congress says the dual use CPP research policies are, we believe, are, are on the cusp of evolving again. So, Greg, any thoughts there? Thanks so much. Uh, and Carrie, thank you for that. I, I wish that I had gotten that talk when I started at OSTP with you. Uh, <laughs> that would have saved me about 18 months of, of learning things the hard way, uh, including reading Rocco's report uh, page by page. Just, uh, <laughs> just had to get out of the skip more often. No, that's right. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Dr. Parker, thank you for the, the framing. So I'll, I'll be brief and I, I will focus on, we've just heard a, a really comprehensive lay down of the past. And, and Carrie, when I had the pleasure of serving with you at the White House, you used to kind of remind us that you know, these issues are not new. We've been having 
having the same conversation effectively for decades. And so you would begin a lot of meetings and sort of say, what is new? And that was a spur to me to go and figure that out. And uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I didn't have to go very far to be reminded of what was new. So I, I had an interesting experience in that I started at OSTP uh, in the Jerry Epstein chair uh, for biosecurity uh, uh, in May of 2021. And when I sat down, a paper came across my desk that was from uh, John Jumper and DeepMind, and it was the results from a formerly esoteric competition where uh, a bunch of nerds, and I consider myself one, so I use that term with love, uh, would sit down and try to uh, use computers to predict uh, from a sequence what protein would emerge structurally. Uh, and suddenly, uh, this was front page news. And the reason was because uh, effectively figuring out how proteins folded was a 50 year challenge, and it had suddenly been solved. And it had been solved by people who were relative outsiders using the technology of deep learning and now artificial intelligence to do that. And that surprised people. And it surprised me as a, as a newly minted bureaucrat who hadn't been following this at all. But I think even more interestingly, it surprised the community of practice that had been watching this all along. And they had the ability to do that because there was a competition. It literally had a performance metric. And you could watch a relatively stagnant uh, trend suddenly explode. And then there was the front page. Uh, and then that was when I started at OSTP. And when I left, I had the sort of equally bewildering experience of um, at the time that that challenge had been solved when I started in 2021, there were on the order of like 100,000 solved protein structures. When I left, uh, DeepMind had just released, I think, 200 million protein structures, and then they got one up to my meta who did 600 million. So there was roughly a 3,000-fold increase in it, uh, structural biological knowledge within the tenure of a single bureaucrat. Uh, and, and, and when I left, I handed off the same policy debate that Kerry just educated us on to my successors. And so I felt very palpably uh, what people have called the pacing problem, that the, the, the rate at which we make uh, policy has not really changed very much since the age of sale, uh, and yet technology is moving at this sort of exponential rocket ship pace, uh, and that is an incredible challenge. Uh, and so I, I left OSTP and uh, I, I transitioned the, the responsibility of making policy, which as we've just heard is really hard, and I turned my attention along with many others and folks in this room towards how can we get new data to inform policy making? And in particular in this space, how can we start to measure what is new? And so we all know that uh, artificial intelligence in particular is incredibly hyped. Uh, but we also know there is something there. If any of you have spent any time having a conversation with an algorithm today, you can remember that a handful of years ago, if you said you would be doing that, people would have looked at you like you had two heads. And yet that is now for image generation, for text generation, the day-to-day -day life that we live. We have started to see what may be a similar takeoff in uh, generative biology, but it's very early days. And so I think one of the goals that I have professionally, and many of you in this room do as well, is that we not repeat history here and uh, sort of explode into hyperbole and to, into retrenchment. Uh, as we have these profoundly new uh, powerful new capabilities, we know that at the end of this rainbow is incredible benefit for society if we do this well. And we also know that we could foreclose those opportunities if we uh, uh, become uh, sort of uh, anaphylactic about uh, biosecurity concerns. And so I think um, one of the ways to cut through this is to be as rigorous and scientific about understanding security and safety as we are about doing any other science. Uh, and so uh, one of the, uh, I think, rare instances where policy has moved almost as fast as technology is uh, the White House's artificial intelligence executive order included uh, a number of provisions about biology and its intersection with safety, security, and opportunity. And I think uh, the creation of things like the USAI Safety Institute and the call for metrics and evaluations so that we understand what models can and can't do, who can and can't use them, and what that does and doesn't mean uh, for our society is the way forward. And it also means we have a lot of work to do. Uh, so I thought I was doing something clever by uh, helping to author uh, the AI uh, executive order with a number of folks here. And then when I left government and then went to uh, RAND, uh, I found out that people outside of government have to help do all that work. So <laughs> that's the work that I'm in now. Uh, and uh, happy to take questions on that front. Very Greg. Uh, Greg, thanks. Um, and finally, for Alan Slobodin, so um, it's, just, it's not just a scientific community is debating these policies over gain-of-function research concern. We know the US Congress and your committee specifically has been very active on this front. Um, so as, 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 a, as a member of the majority committee staff involved in oversight of these, this issue, what activities has the committee pursued in the area of gain-of-function research to concern or enhance potential pandemic pathogen research? Alan? Thank you, Jerry. <clears throat> Thank you, American Enterprise Institute, uh, for this event and inviting me to participate. Uh, the House Energy and Commerce Committee 
well, not apparent from its name, is the committee in the U.S. House of Representatives with legislative jurisdiction over public health. I am part of the team that works on the subcommittee on oversight and investigations. It's a subcommittee exclusively devoted to in-depth fact-finding investigations. Why are we doing oversight on the committee about gain-of-function research? Because we don't want to accidentally start a pandemic, but we also want to find medical solutions as soon as possible. Because we don't know what we don't know. Uh, former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld called it unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. And if one looks throughout the history of our country and our free countries, it is the latter category that tends to be the difficult ones. That's his quote. What happens in a biological research laboratory when you think you know what you don't know? You ship live anthrax. Let me explain. In 2015, it was discovered that a U.S. Army laboratory in Dugway, Utah, shipped live anthrax samples to 192 locations around the world. And they, in turn, because they didn't know either, sent it to other locations. Why did this happen? Because the laboratory did not know that its inactivation of the anthrax was not working. Our committee held a hearing and then requested that the Government Accountability Office examine inactivation protocols at the Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Department of Agriculture labs, which led to changes in the relevant guidances on inactivation protocols. It's in the context of this history that Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers, the chair of the full committee, Congressman Brett Guthrie, the chair of the health subcommittee, and Congressman Morgan Griffith, the chair of our oversight investigation subcommittee, have jointly pursued numerous inquiries related to gain-of-function research of concern or research involving enhanced pathogens with pandemic potential. I'm going to discuss three of these inquiries to give you a sense of the interests and concerns of the committee. Uh, the first comes from the, our COVID origins investigation. Uh, these three leaders have been investigating the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic going back to March 2021, when they were on the minority side of the committee. This investigation included many letters, including one dated October 27th, 2021, to the National Institutes of Health. This letter questioned in detail a grant made by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, Deco Health Alliance, on coronavirus uh, research in China and Southeast Asia for the 2014-2019 timeframe. This grant included a subaward to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The focus of this letter was on a transgenic mice experiment that has gained attention in the discussions over gain-of-function research. Specifically, questions arose over whether this experiment involving chimeric bat SARS-like viruses was subject to the gain-of-function research pause and effect at the time the experiment was proposed in 2016. NIAID and EcoHealth Alliance exchanged letters about this experiment. These letters, which have since become public through Freedom of Information Act requests, provide an unusual window into the non-public process of how NIH scientists determine whether the research is subject to greater regulatory scrutiny. NIAID determined that the experiment was not subject to the pause based on EcoHealth's and NIAID's conclusion that the viruses in the experiment were phylogenetically distant from the SARS virus and not expected to show an increase in pathogenicity in the transgenic mice that had human ACE2 receptors. In an abundance of caution, NIAID required that EcoHealth immediately notify them if excessive gr virus growth occurred in the experiment, excessive virus growth being defined as a one log increase compared to the growth of the backbone virus. EcoHealth conveyed findings of the experiment or experiments in an April 2018 year four progress report and in a year five progress report that was to be submitted in the summer of 2019 but wasn't actually submitted until 
August of 2021. However, the results according to the NIH were unexpected, showing some of the chimeras being tested were more pathogenic than the backbone virus comparator. The NIH Office of Extramural Affairs later found that there was excessive virus growth found in brain tissue pathology results, and therefore EcoHealth had not complied with the excessive uh, growth policy because there had been no immediate notification. These concerns later led to the Wuhan Institute of Virology being debarred from receiving federal funding for 10 years because the WIV would not provide the laboratory notebooks and electronic files associated with the mice experiment. In February 2023, the three leaders now on the majority side reaffirmed the origins investigation. Even after nearly three years, we are still trying to get all the pertinent information and documents related to how the NIH generally and individual institutes such as NIAID handle such reviews. Among the questions we are asking, what were the risks and benefits of these experiments? Is there a standardized review process to make determinations about the risks and benefits of these experiments? Were less risky alternative approaches considered? If not, why not? Why was this experiment found not subject to the pause or to the HHS P3CO framework? Was this transgenic mice experiment using a valid scientific model? Should the result of this experiment have been considered more likely than anticipated? How can the decision-making process be improved to make more accurate assessments, assuming we need to pursue gain-of-function research options? What is the scientific evidence to support the effectiveness of mitigation of risks if the research is to proceed? Second inquiry uh, I will highlight for you is uh, about gain-of-function research facts. Our committee leaders are also interested in an objective, nonpartisan fact-finding about gain-of-function research. On August 1st, 2023, they requested that the GAO follow up its January 2023 report on high-risk research and review the following questions. One, what terms and definitions do federal agencies use to refer to gain-of-function research? What gaps, if any, exist among the different definitions? And what potential changes are under consideration for, these, for those definitions? Two, what are the benefits and risks of different types of gain-of-function research? Three, what tangible outcomes, such as the development of medical countermeasures, have resulted from the different types of federally funded gain-of-function research, including the enhancement of potential pandemic pathogens. Four, what are the risks associated with gain-of-function research? And to what extent can lab safety protocols mitigate these risks? Are there particular challenges with overseeing the mitigation of such risks for gain-of-function research uh, conducted abroad? The work on this request is underway, and we look forward to seeing what the GAO learns. Uh, the third uh, inquiry I'm going to highlight are uh, the review processes at HHS and NIH. Uh, in April 2022, the three leaders wrote to the Department of Health and Human Services to get more details about the little known HHS P3CO committee, such as the members who's on the panel and the decision-making process. While we received some partial information, not all questions were addressed and more work needs to be done to make the oversight process of risky research more transparent, both within NIH and HHS. Through March 2023 and a May 1st oversight request, the committee leaders are seeking more details about the processes of the Internal Review Committee at NIAID uh, for extramural research experiments of concern and the review entity in the NIH Office of Director for intramural research experiments. At the Oversight and Investigations Subcommittee, we are working to get more facts that can be shared with the public to better inform the legislative and policymaking processes regarding gain-of-function research of concern. Through this endeavor, Chair Rogers has emphasized the need to rebuild public trust through more transparency and engagement. The rationale is captured by what a congressman said about another event last week, quote, Basic Human Psychology 101. Fewer facts and more mystery is more scary. More facts and less mystery 
is less scary. Much of this discussion over gain-of-function research is difficult because parts of the basic information needed for understanding remain secret. Even some members of the scientific community working in this system have indicated frustration with the excessive secrecy. Other parts of this discussion are not well understood by non-scientists and requires more engagement between non-scientists and scientists, and even among scientists of different disciplines. Through transparency, constructive oversight, and open dialogue, our nation can rebuild trust in our public health institutions and gain a common purpose to be much better prepared for pandemics and other major public health emergencies in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alan. You summed up um, really all the pertinent questions very well in, in uh, covering um, in, your, in your remarks that are associated with um, oversight of dual use and EPP research. They're hard questions to, to answer, and we're not going to be able to answer all those today, but um, I, I, I think it's critical that your committee continue to try to answer some of these questions. And maybe I'll throw the first question um, to you um, and probably to the other panelists as well. How, how, come, how come there hasn't been more bipartisan support to try to unpack some of these answers? Because biosafety and biosecurity is nonpartisan. And, and, and I think both, both sides of the aisle um, share a same vision of we need life science innovation, we need new medical countermeasures, we need a strong pandemic preparedness and biodefense, but we also must do it safely and securely, and we must rebuild public trust in, in this unique um, enterprise. And so why, why don't we um, have, have more bipartisan interest in this topic? And you may not be able to answer it because maybe there's not a good answer. Uh, yeah, I... It, 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 that's a difficult one to answer. Uh, you know, the, the request we made to the Government Accountability Office on the inactivation protocols I referenced in my remarks, that was a bipartisan request. And uh, our oversight uh, prior to the pandemic had been, as you correctly observed, was uh, pretty generally bipartisan on uh, oversight of high containment laboratories and the Federal Select Agent Program and, and, and so forth. Uh, but the pandemic has, has just changed things, and um, we're just in a more polarized situation. I can't really speak for my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, uh, you know, uh, but we were interested in working with them. We wanted, uh, when we started uh, our look into the COVID origins, um, we were hoping to work together with them, uh, or even on a GAO request letter, just on not getting into the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic, but just on uh, how about a request on biological attribution for future pandemics and, and, and having a more well-developed strategy going forward. So um, situation right now is uh, unfortunately we, we don't have that right now, but uh, my door's always open. I'm always interested. Uh, uh, I think the interest w would be there if they were uh, interested in joining us. Kerry, Greg, do you have any thoughts on the, you know, wh why, why aren't we experiencing more bipartisan support to, well, for, the, the, for that, the politics of this? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think I'll turn that on the he its head mm -hmm. and focus on where we do see bipartisan support and where we've long seen bipartisan support, which I think is sort of a general interest in continuously bolstering the biosafety and biosecurity um, system under which we operate domestically, internationally, trying to make it flexible enough to keep pace mm -hmm. with the cutting edge science that we see coming down the pike. Um, you know, the, the two challenges, I think, in the, the um, one is perennial and one is most challenging in the current environment, is one person's flexibility is another person's ambiguity. And so you want to stay flexible to be able to adjust with the evolution of the science and the understanding as we go forward. But when it comes to things like security or oversight, like 
Flexibility can be a double-edged sword because um, that brings us to the second challenge uh, in the current environment, which is I really like Mark's proposal to do something IRB-esque. If anyone's participated in IRB to protect human participants in research, it's real people who are you know, well-meaning and dedicated to protecting people who are volunteering for research, ethicists, members of the public, scientific experts, and they sit down and they have a conversation and sometimes they agree, sometimes they don't agree, but they come to a general sort of consensus it involves a lot of human judgment and a lot of sort of flexibility. And when they walk out of that room, there are going to be reasonable people who disagree with that judgment. And there are going to be reasonable people who agree with that. And none of them are wrong at the end of the day until something goes wrong. And then there's a lot of sort of Tuesday morning quarterbacking of we should have, could have, would have done this sort of thing. And I think that is the big challenge we are rising in in a lot of these discussions of oversight in a very politicized, you know, hyperbolic, passionate environment where um, it is not so satisfying to have these, you know, squishier, we need everybody to come into the room and have a conversation and do the best we can at the, at the end of the day. I think that, it, that doesn't feel satisfying from an oversight point of view when what you really want is regulation. And back to my, like the point I made, Regulation is hard. It is a real thing. It carries penalties. It carries jail time. And, and this area of um, risk and benefit may not lend itself to that sort of hardened framework. And that leaves you feeling a little bit dissatisfied in an environment where it is really hard to sit down and have those consensus building, reasonable people can agree to disagree kinds of conversations. Let me pull on that thread real quick before I go to you, Greg. It's so and, you know, I, I, IRB and, and local institutional oversight, I think, is critically important. And we have institutional biosafety committees. And the, um, I guess, the quality of the input and the discussion across all institutions around the United States varies. And so there has been some discussion about how do we upregulate so to speak, I'm using that term. I shouldn't use upregulate, regulate, but you know what I mean. How, how do we how do we put the I the IBCs, institutional biosafety committees, on a more even footing, on par with our IRBs and our laboratory animal use committees that actually do have some force of law and some of the things that they they do? Is that possible to do that with the IBCs? I, I think it is possible. I mean, it's a good example of why things like policy versus regulation matter, because the IRB system is grounded in a regulation, the common rule. Um, the IBC system has been um, a bless them, like repurposed over time, right? Like they started, you know, just looking at recombinant DNA. They had a very mm -hmm. narrow um, focus. And over time, we have asked them to do more and more and more to enter much more into the pathogen space, to enter more into the biosecurity space, which was sort of not their original mm -hmm. purpose, but they have remained rooted in sort of their original guidelines. So, I mean, that is, you know, a, a, a I think, policy question is, you know, is there a way to better strengthen resource empower at the local level institutional biosafety committees to do the sorts of things that we are asking them to do in a much more expansive way now? And Greg, I'll come back to you. With, how can we turn down the political rhetoric, rhetoric so we can get, get this back in a more uh, constructive dialogue? No, it, it's a great question, and I, actually, I, I like Harry's framing as well of sort of let's find those points of convergence. And I think actually the example of bioattribution is a really good one uh, because uh, we were actually able uh, on on the White House side. I think we actually got that letter of sort of the, the inquiry of interest about attribution, and this was a topic where we could sort of separate this from the really contentious and at the time especially inflamed rhetoric about COVID origins and say, look, setting that aside, uh, we need to understand where pathogens come from. Uh, for biosecurity reasons, for even uh, broader strategic reasons, for pandemic response especially, how can we do that technically? And as soon as we reframe that conversation, we were able to have uh, at the White House at the time in December of 2022, a totally nonpartisan technical discussion about what is possible here. 
Uh, and, and that was reflected in the National Biodefense Strategy and its implementation plan, uh, similarly on the UK with their biosecurity strategy. And so I think if we can take some of these, I, I think you said it exactly right, biosafety, biosecurity are, are bipartisan interests, they're capabilities that we know we have to have domestically and globally, and they back ultimately into falsifiable technical capabilities that we can go and pursue together. Uh, and so I think reframing some of these uh, efforts in the lens of let's do something that matters on behalf of everyone and less, uh, let's point fingers uh, might be one way forward. Now I'll just share maybe one of my own kind of recent experiences. I had the opportunity to testify before these, the uh, select committee on the coronavirus pandemic back in mid-October and the topic was laboratory biosafety. And of course it got into the EPP and dual use research oversight as well. But I had, had an opportunity to visit with several members the day before the hearing. And I essentially you know, said, look, I know your job as members are to look backwards and look forward. You know, I, What I'm really here coming today for this hearing that, that week, I don't remember the date, it was mid-October, is to try to help the members and the staff look forward. And um, I, I I, I hope that would be the spirit that the hearing was in, and it largely was. Um, in fact, uh, um, the chair and the ranking member both had very, very similar talking points, and it included we need to modernize and harmonize our bio-risk management framework domestically and internationally, so I was, I was heartened by that. And I know after the, after the, the hearing, um, sometime after the hearing, the, the chair and the ranking member actually signed a joint letter, which seems to be kind of rare at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> asking GAO to look at um, G20 bio-risk management frameworks and their biosafety, biosecurity guidelines and policies and compare them to the United States, um, which I thought was a positive move. So I think there is, there is an opportunity or some opportunity even in our divisive environment at the moment to try to turn the rhetoric down so we can have a constructive conversation because this is an urgent issue. Uh, this, we've been debating, as we've heard, if you've learned today, we've been debating these issues for over 20 years. And it's, it's, it's hard, and as Kerry said, implementing policy is hard, particularly when the definitions are a little squishy. And, but we've, we've got to figure it out. We've got to figure it out. And we need all of us thinking about this on a very, very kind of similar page to, to get beyond the divisiveness and, and figure this out. Um, the scientific community needs it. Our public needs it. And we need to work together in, in these communities. And so maybe we're getting close to 1700 or 5 o'clock, so maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I should end with one more question myself and, and open up for just a few audience questions. So, I, and, and this is prompted by a question I received today when I walked in here. And so, <laughs> and the question was, do you, Jerry Parker, know why the OSTP hasn't come out with new guide, guidance on these issues? And of course, I didn't know. I don't know. And so, do any of you know why? <laughs> And I think I know the answer. And, and, and so we, nope, so don't we know. don't know. And so, um, um, but we, I think we all understand that uh, the policies are under consideration in our agency. OSTP did put it out an RFI back in September asking for rec, um, in, input into, into the discussion. So uh, time, time will tell. And hopefully this discussion today may help in, inform that. So with that, I will just say, I assume it's because they're being thoughtful and deliberative about policy change. Hi, Emily Ricotta. Oh. Um, thank you so much. This is a really interesting uh, discussion today. I want to ask a question about transparency because I think that transparency is really important. However, what is Congress, what are our government agencies doing to make sure that the things we learn through this transparency are actually um, digestible by the public because if transparency is meant to be for the good of the public but they can't they're not going to be able to understand these things that are uncovered especially you know a lot of the answers to the questions in the investigation great questions and great things to know but the general public isn't going to understand a lot of that and so what's being done that once these answers are obtained how are we working as people who are policy setters and guidance builders and all of that, how are we working to make sure that this information is actually going to be useful to the public and not just we're doing lip service to government transparency? I will start, and just from based on some of my own experience over the years in government and since I've, 
In the 10 years since I've left government, um, we do a bad job as scientists communicating complex topics, and we've got to do better. We just got to do better. And that's part of uh, um, regaining public trust and confidence in what we do. In our, and I'm a big champion of high containment labs and why they're so essential um, to our research enterprise and biodefense and pandemic preparedness and, and the research that goes in, in there. So we just got to figure out how to do a better job of communicating. Others? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think it's, it's continuous improvement, right? I mean, I think there are a lot of people inside government, outside government, in the media, working really hard at this. And sometimes they are succeeding, sometimes they are wildly not succeeding um, uh, for, for a lot of reasons. But it is also, I will say, and I mean, AI has some great, has had great events on this, a difficult landscape now on which to be able to convey accurate information. There's a lot of ways in which people receive information. There are a lot of issues, of course, um, with uh, disinformation and misinformation, I think erosion of trust in what is a trusted institution. And so it is a real challenge, but not a challenge we should back away from. And so it's really important to have fora like this and, and you know, sort of these continual public conversations. Anybody else? Uh, on the transparency point, you know, uh, there are like three different scenarios I, I'm, uh, right off the bat. There, so the first scenario is transparency. To, uh, I'm talking transparency principally at the National Institutes of Health vis-a-vis Congress and to committees with the uh, jurisdiction and the uh, sharing of, of information that Congress is asking for. And that, uh, candidly, has been, been a real struggle because uh, we're, uh, there seems to be real resistance uh, to uh, to being open with the Congress about this kind of a topic. And so it's very, it's going very slowly in trying to learn about these review processes, just to get the basic facts. How does this process work? How do you make these decisions? Uh, what are even, we're still even trying to get our arms on the facts about the EcoHealth grant. I mean, that sounds, but I'm just telling you, uh, we're trying to be very diligent, and we, we don't feel we've got the, uh, you know, 100% of the picture. So that's one part of the transparency. Another part of the transparency is within the NIH itself. So when I spoke about uh, their assessment uh, at the NIAID about a particular experiment, and that uh, well, we don't think it's subject to the gain of function research pause. You know, we think uh, uh, because these viruses are more, uh, you know, genetically distant, phylogenetically distant uh, from SARS. That uh, even though it was a grant about that, that its, its, its aim was about trying to predict pandemics, but that's not where they were not trying to find viruses that were. Uh, more pathogenic than what was known in the wild. And then they came back to us and said, well, um, it was an unexpected result in that experiment. Well, then that would be a point of self-reflection, I would think, at NIAID to learn internally. Like, so why was it an unexpected result? Did you miss something? Or was it impossible to know? or to, to basically uh, make better use of, of what, is, what you learn from these decision-making processes and what you're getting right and what, and what you could do better. How are you learning to make it a better system? And then the third is you know, being more transparent with the public. And, and this goes back to the whole, uh, I think it is relevant to the political problem, which is there's, uh, a lot of the public is distrustful of our uh, public health agencies and, uh, and scientists these days. And uh, the way my chair thinks they can be addressed is through more openness 
and transparency. Not keeping things, make it less mysterious, provide more information and better understanding, and you know, have a dialogue with the public to meet them where they are about what is it they're worried about, their sphere about what are, what are these experiments all about? Why do we gotta do them? And, and if we gotta do them, do we have really a way to know with a great deal of confidence that we could do it safely and that the mitigation measures actually work and that they've been validated? No, thank, thanks, Alan, for really your frank, frank assessments. And I would just made me think as you were giving your answer about a different era, a different time, a different scenario, but you were probably providing oversight on me and, and programs that was after Hurricane Katrina. And that at the time was the largest natural disaster that our country had ever faced. And uh, there was many deaths and, and a failure in government all, at all levels. And I was a, the predecessor of ASPR at the time, but I remember being subjected to a lot of oversight and a lot of congressional requests. We didn't hold back anything. Every email, everything that we had at our op center, it went out. And were there embarrassing emails? Yes. But we were actually exonerated um, because we were being accused of some deaths in nursing homes in, in, in the affected area. But it, um, some, of our, some of our email messages actually showed that we had, we had attempted to reach out to individual nursing homes from the federal level to, do you need help? Do you need help? Anyway, it's just part of that transparency. A different era, I recognize a different era, different scenarios, not related to this, but um, transparency is, is important. I think, are we, do we have time for any more or one more? I think I'm pointing to you first. Thank you. Um, we'll do two more. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Bryce Nichols. I'm with Biosafety now, but I also run an NIH-funded lab at Rutgers University. I love, I really like this discussion, and I wanted to particularly acknowledge you for looking back and saying what I did wrong and sort of acknowledging that there, and I appreciate that. With regard to transparency, one of the questions that was asked was about public, and one thing I definitely want to point out from my perspective is that scientists, and I'm an NIH-funded scientist, we serve the public. They don't serve us. The public is not stupid. The public can understand basic things. Transparency, one simple thing is where the labs, right? When we talk about transparency, forget all of the nuance and minutia of the dangerous experiments. The public doesn't know where the labs are. I think everyone in this room would support, we should, right? Letting the public know where the labs are. How can the public trust us if we are not telling them where the labs are? Two is what are the organisms work that are being worked on in those labs? That's it. Those two things would make a big difference about everything else you're talking about. The right to know. Public has a right to know this stuff. It's being hidden. It's being intentionally hidden. I understand that there are concerns about biosecurity, but where did the anthrax attack come from? Inside. It came from inside. So we need to acknowledge that the public needs to know if they're working with Ebola down the street. I mean, come on. This is absurd, and that sh should be a democratic issue, right? I mean, public safety. This is, this is a public safety issue and a transparency issue, which is right up the Democrats' alley, okay? So that's all I'll say. Can Emily ask a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. last question. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you, Dr. Parker. Um, I guess as a layperson, I'm confused what the consequences are when there is an unethical scientist. I feel like I've heard a lot of discussion about you know, what an ethical scientist would do. But if there is a bad actor or someone who is just irresponsible, you know, Alan nodded to the fact that, you know, with the EcoHealth grant, there are program officers at NIAD and there are researchers working in America who flouted regulation. And there doesn't seem to have been any consequences for that. Not only that, but we have evidence that those same researchers told the Pentagon they were gonna do research out of BSL-3 in America, and in fact outsourced it to a BSL-2 in Wuhan in order to make the research go more quickly and more cheaply. Um, and thus far, there haven't been any civil criminal penalties at all. So I guess I'm confused and respectfully disagree with the idea that we should only look forward, because if there are no consequences for being unethical, then, I mean, what are we discussing, essentially? 
So thank you. No, I, I mean, we have to look backwards and forwards. You know, I, I, I use the example of the hearing I went to recently to, to try to keep that particular hearing looking forward and uh, recognizing that the members and the committee and the staff need to do both. And, and we as a country need to do both. Uh, but we've got to find a way to do it, and it's in, it's in a productive, non-divisive way, and that's that's um, nonpartisan. That's all. Could I comment? Sure. Yes, sir. So, no, I don't want to leave you with the impression that that we we have an open investigation on this. I'm simply stating we're still trying to get information. So this is an open, active investigation, and so it remains to be seen. You know where this is going to go. And there's also another uh, a committee also uh, uh, conducting their investigation in parallel. So that is a live issue. That is, that that's not over. <laughs> and you don't know how it's going to turn out. Yep. It, it's yet to be seen how it's going to turn out. So I think we're at end time. Is that correct? <laughs> so one, I want to thank the panel members for very frank conversations um, this, this was very, very good, and, and the questions from the from the audience and those who participated, we didn't get a chance to get to any online questions. I'm sure there were some there, but anyway, I want to thank I want to thank the American Enterprise Institute for hosting this this discussion today. It, it's an it's an urgent discussion. And it's a very serious discussion, and it does need some thoughtful uh, consideration, like I think we had today. So, um, thank you very much.